Jesus is the fullness of God in man. Became a man. God emptied himself and came into the substance of humanity, into flesh and blood. This was Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. He was made able to suffer. He was made as a man so that he could suffer and so that he could pay the price for sin. Sin is unbelief. Sin is the curse that came upon humanity through disobedience. It's the separating wall that causes people to be blocked from the communication that they have with God. But faith destroys the power of sin. And Jesus Christ is the faithful one. He's the righteous one. He's the one that came to redeem all humanity from the curse of the law. And the end of the curse of the law, which is sin, is death. And we'll see here in Hebrews, the second chapter, the ninth verse, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He showed the way of perfection, not by fighting for our own way, but by laying down our will. Jesus said, I've come, it's written of me in the book, I've come to do thy will, O God. And when we're born again of, of faith, of the word of God, we've been given a new nature that's able to obey God. According to the law, according to our flesh, we're unable to keep God's words. We're unable to walk in the precepts and in the ordinances and in the covenants of God. But God gives us a new nature through the faith of Jesus Christ. And he died to take away our consciousness of sin, to remove from us the curse of the law that we might be remade in his image and in his likeness through new birth according to the seed of faith. And that's the word that we preach See, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who are already rich and have all that they need, what do they need with God? But though, those who have poverty of spirit, that know that they have need, there's an open heart. There's an avenue open, a door of utterance. We pray like Paul did that he might give us a, a door of utterance to begin to speak the mysteries of the kingdom of God that are available to all those who would believe. That's why Jesus consistently said, fear not, only believe. He said, your unbelief will block you, but by faith, there's an entrance made for you to begin to walk into the kingdom of light, out of the kingdom of darkness, into the light and the glory of the kingdom of the Son of God. He said, seek first the kingdom of God, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things, all the needs for your body, everything that you have need of for your natural man will be met through your relationship with the Son of God. Through your relationship and your faith in Jesus Christ, all you need to do is ask and you'll receive. Does it take away from the fact that we have responsibilities and that we have to work and we have to do these things? No, God empowers us to do what we need to do by the Holy Spirit. And we begin to find ourselves able to do much more than we ever thought we could because of the grace that is given unto us. And the stumbling block of our unbelief and our weakness begin to be replaced with a strength and a vitality and a, a wisdom that we didn't even know was available to us. And out of our deep poverty and our inability to get, because of our faith in the Lord and our trust in Him, He begins to pour out into us a richness, 
of the glory of God. And this is the mystery that's been hid from ages and from generations past, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the anointing of God coming to you through faith in Jesus Christ and by your confession and your surrender of your life unto him where you say, I don't want to do my own will any longer. I want to do those things that God has ordained for me that I might walk in the light of the covenant of God and see those things that I need be brought into my path. And that's the beauty of the Lord. He does that by faith, by activating our faith through the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And that's why God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Oh, to many people it's a stumbling block and to many people it's foolishness but unto those who believe, the preaching of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is the power of God unto righteousness. In other words, it gives you an availability to walk in right standing with God. So that you can do those things that please God and please man. And you begin to actually have favor with God and man. Doesn't mean that everything you do, the world loves. Just as Jesus even though you do the right things and say the right things, the world hates you because the Spirit of God is enmity with flesh and, and the world can't receive the things of God. But you don't have to worry about that. You can rejoice in the persecution that comes and the hatred that comes your way and you can turn around and bless in the face of a curse because you know that you're blessed and that no man can steal your blessing. The blessing that comes from God, the gifts that come with God are from God are without repentance, and they're going to keep you and build you up until the day of the full appearance of the Son of God, the day star that arises right out of our heart, right out of the depths of our being, and causes us to live continually in the kingdom of God, consciously there, where we know that we're bone of his bone and we're flesh of his flesh, we live in him and he lives in us. So this, is, this was the son of God, Jesus, who was made perfect through sufferings. And he says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. This is the Lord. Speaking of the Father. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, that's us. He also himself, Jesus, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. What a mighty God we serve. What wisdom, what understanding, what knowledge was given unto the Lord that he became obedient unto death. And through his obedience, through his dying, the death that he died on the cross, through that death, through that weaponry, he was able to destroy the works and the power of the devil where there was no hold on his life. What they meant for evil, God meant for good. And he, and he took every weapon that was formed against Christ and caused it not to prosper in the way that the enemy thought it would prosper, but prosper unto eternal life and unto a, a, a fruitfulness that came by the multiplication of that seed through many believers. Thank God. And so it is today that we war not according to the flesh. The weakness of the cross, what was considered to be weakness, was all-powerful because the pains of death could not hold the Lord Jesus Christ. On the third day, he sprung up out of the grave, never to die again. 
unto eternal life. So he put, says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. We're not trying to go and convert the masses by forced obedience, trying to rule it over them with carnal weaponry as they did during the crusades, either be converted or die. We, we win converts by the goodness of God. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. Repentance means a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of attitude, a change of direction, doing an about face, going in one direction with, with all the understanding that you had and then turning and going the opposite direction because a change, a, a place of repentance. And God gives meat for repentance. That means he gives the ability to repent through the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what changes the hearts and the minds of humanity, not through the strength of carnal weaponry, but through the strength of the Spirit of God. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit brings repentance. And when He comes, speaking of the Spirit, He brings repentance. He brings judgment. He causes hearts to change. Thanks be unto God, who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. The same Spirit that was in Jesus Christ, if it rules in us, it will begin to quicken us. And it will begin to bring light to us. And as the light comes to us, we don't just hide the light under our own home, under our own roof, under our dwelling place, under a lampshade, under a rock, somewhere where we go and hide and try to keep the light for fear that it'll disturb people out in the world. We take the light of God and we rush into the darkest place that we can find when God gives us the will and the power to do so. And by that, light springs out of a dark place and the darkness has to flee away and the coming of the Lord comes to pass because the Lord appears in the midst of a dark and a crooked and a perverse generation and he begins to convert souls. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through the good news of Jesus Christ, through the light of the kingdom of God that springs right out of a dark place, right out of our heart, right in the midst of our earth, even in the midst of our corruption, even though we're dying according to the flesh, even though we're, our bodies are disintegrating just like everybody else's at this point in this time in the world, we're, we're still able to get sick, we're still able to die, we're in flesh and blood just as Jesus was. And yet in the midst of that corruption, there's perfection. And it's the seed and the glory of God that's been hidden in these earthen vessels made of clay that out of us the glory of God might be seen, not according to our own goodness or our righteousness, but by faith and by trust in Jesus Christ. And he gets all the glory. So he says, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We're not out here trying to beat people into submission. But we are wrestling against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. It's the spirit of darkness, the spirit of unbelief. That's the root of sin. The root of sin is unbelief. The knowledge of God is has been darkened. People are always frightened of what they don't know, what they don't understand. Their vision has been blurred. There's a veil. And for that reason, people run and tuck tail. They try to stay out of God's path for fear of that they'll be consumed that his judgment and his wrath 
be poured out. But thank God for the good news of the gospel. Because the judgment of God's wrath was poured out upon one man. In the beginning, it was poured out on Adam. And so death passed upon all flesh. But in the end of days, in the end of the times that were spoken of in the scripture, God's wrath was poured on upon the second Adam, even Jesus Christ. And he took all of the wrath of God at the cross. He paid the price for every human soul. So that we, through our faith in the cross of Christ and through the resurrection of the dead, by a new and a living way, which is the Lord Jesus Christ and his life that's indwelled us by the Holy Spirit, can run boldly to the throne of grace without any wrath, without any doubt, knowing that we've been made friends through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's raising us up to be in the same image as the first son, Jesus Christ the Lord. Not as individuals, but as a many-membered body. Praise the Lord. So now we get our eyes off of the curse of the world. We put them upon Jesus. And when the curse, the, uh, the, the spirits of unbelief that keep people in bondage out here in the world and beat them down, that's where the wrath of God is poured out. Not on the people. Jesus paid the price for the souls. Through the gospel, through the power and the weaponry of Christ, we bring every spirit, every thought into obedience through the knowledge of the Lord. And we dispel every spirit of darkness by the authority of the Spirit of God in Jesus Christ. And to put on every piece, it says in verse 13, of God's armor, so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news, so that you will be fully prepared in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. That means persistence in prayer means we don't stop just because we don't see an immediate change. But we trust the word of God. We have to know that whatever we ask in his name, we're going to receive. And when we say in his name, it doesn't mean it's a magic word. It means in the nature of Christ, who's given his own life for us, not to do his own will, but the will of the Father who sent him. And we're standing in that same place of the Lord Jesus Christ, in that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. He paid the price for us that we might stand together in that name. And we say, if we pray in that nature, that spirit, that will of the Father, it's a guarantee that it's going to be brought to pass. It's a guarantee that we're going to see the fulfillment of it manifested out here in the world. That those things that as Jesus taught him how to pray, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. When we speak it by the Spirit of God, it's done in heaven. It is a done deal. Jesus promised that we would receive that which we asked for. It's done in heaven. Now we're just waiting for it to be manifested on the earth. That's the guarantee. That's what Jesus said. He that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Now that's a promise, the 13th verse. Whatsoever you will ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That means standing in that nature, that obedience of Christ, that place of complete submission, complete surrender to the will of the Father. 
What does it mean? It means we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit, Paul said, with utterances and groanings too deep for words, He teaches us. He prays through us. It's a beautiful thing that we can be united with God in this manner through Christ Jesus the Lord. The mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now He sent His Spirit, the, the, the same Spirit that was in Jesus Christ, to be our comfort, to let us know that we're walking in the paths of righteousness. 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, the 3rd verse, says, For though we live in the world, speaking of this war that we're waging, isn't it incredible that Jesus already won the battle through Calvary and through overthrowing the power of Satan, which was death that came through unbelief and disobedience. And Jesus destroyed that power when God raised him from the dead. And yet here we are, still in a sense in the battle. All the battles won. The Lord already destroyed the enemy. And yet it doesn't take a fool to look out and see the enemy's works all around us. People beat down. People in sickness and disease and, and sorrow and harm it still fills the earth. We're not walking around with blinders on. But we believe that that which was done in heaven in the holy place is now being done in the earth through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the confidence of our faith and the assurance of God's word, we become partakers of the divine nature of Christ here in the earth. We become the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the temple. You are the temple of the living God who has indwelt you bodily. When you put your faith and your trust in the Lord, he, you're going to see the works of the Lord manifest in your life. And in all of those that you join together with, in the faith of Christ, even if there's only two or three, Jesus said, I'm in the midst of and he's bringing these things to pass. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Is that? That's strongholds in people's minds, in people's hearts, in people's souls, where the, the spirits of darkness have come in. And when we say the spirits of darkness, darkness is nothing more than unbelief, ignorance. It's a lack of light. It's just darkness is nothing more than turning off the lights. The sun going on the other side of the earth. The light's been removed from that place. So the spirit of darkness, the unclean spirits of the world, there's no light in them. There's no knowledge of God. There's no truth. Oh, oh, they they know who the Son of God is. They have that knowledge, but they're not obedient to Him. They don't have the knowledge that brings obedience. Only the Spirit brings that. Only God Himself can bring that. There's only one Spirit that brings knowledge unto obedience, and that's the Holy Ghost. Oh, there's all kinds of spirits that will puff you up with knowledge, intellectualism. But does that give you power over the enemy? Absolutely not. It's the Holy Ghost. That's why Jesus could teach the disciples till he was blue in the face. But what did he tell them? He said, go and wait. And tarry. That means just wait and be patient in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. That means they were filled inside and outside with the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they were filled, there was a new power that they were endued with where they were able to walk in complete obedience, even unto death, even unto the death of the cross, if that's what it took. That means the same life that was in Jesus Christ, 
who was able to lay down his life in complete obedience unto the Father. His mission was the cross, and he came and fulfilled that mission to, a very, to the very T. That same mission, that same ability is in us. And we don't have to be forced to do it. We don't have to be scared into doing it. We don't have to have hell or death or anything pulled over our head. All those things have been removed, and we do these through the joy that's set before us, through the joy of the Holy Spirit. We have a joy to see the vengeance of God poured out on all unbelief, not on the people of the world. God loves the people of the world, and he's come to restore them and to redeem them. Against their unbelief, absolutely, because their unbelief separates them from the life and the blessings and the promises of God, and they're foreigners. They're unable to have fellowship with God and with God's people. But we come with the gospel of redemption and the truth of the light of God that dispels all darkness. New Living Translation, I believe, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Thank God for his marvelous word. We're going to see every word of the Lord completely fulfilled. I'm so thankful it's through the grace and the mercy of Christ.